welcome to This Just In, the show bringing you the latest advancements in healthcare, strategy, innovation, and public policy. And now, for the fastest voice in healthcare, here's your host, Justin Barnes. Thank you for tuning in, and welcome to This Just In. I'm your host, Justin Barnes. In these segments, I'll bring you the latest advancements in healthcare, strategy, innovation, and public policy. As always, we're broadcasting from the This Just In studios on the Business Radio X network, as well as the Healthcare Now radio network. For this episode, my 202nd episode, we have a very special guest and health innovation think tank member, Don McDaniel from Canton & Company. Welcome to the show, Don. Hey, Justin. Thanks for having me. You got it, my friend. So how are you? How are you uh, um, um, going through all this pandemic and, and just basically uh, managing all of this? Yeah, no, I we've uh, I'm doing great. Uh, family's doing really well. We've had uh, uh, a series of of uh, life events that have been really positive. Believe it or not, had had a couple. Actually, have had three grandkids in the last two months. My wow. first three grandkids, um, and uh, my, people in my firm are healthy, and uh, and we've actually grown, and I think we're helping people. So all 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 is positive. I, it's it's not lost on me, and I know on you that. A lot of people have suffered a lot and are still suffering. And so, you know, we we think about them a lot, but, you know, you just try to get up every day and, and keep going and, and have faith and, and prayer that, you know, this is going to evolve and, and we're going to get back to it. But uh, I'm, I'm great. And thank you. Excellent. Great to hear. Go. God bless, man. You had uh, two grandchildren, your first grandchildren. Three. Three. Oh, wow. Three. First in February and then two within about a week of each other in uh, in late April, early May. So, yeah, <laughs> blessed. That's phenomenal. Congratulations. Thank you. And I'm glad everybody's healthy. Yeah, we're yeah. I mean, I certainly um, share your sentiment and respect for the industry and respect for all that is happening in, in, uh, in our community and obviously globally. But you and I both are knee deep in technology, innovation, healthcare, health, IT, digital health. And, you know, our world is you're basically all about service right now. I mean, literally, it's serving our, our you know, our customers, our physicians, our patients, our community, our right. other, you know, corporate members and, and all of that. So really, it's it's come down to service. So, I mean, yes, a lot is is crippling in, in, in some ways. But also, you know, when you when you're in healthcare and health IT right now, it's all about service. It's serving everybody. Absolutely the front lines, whatever it takes, you and I are doing, and I know our peers are doing. So it's a yes. different of a perspective. Cool. So, um, you know, you and I met at uh, the Think Tank last November. That was our first formal meeting. I certainly knew of you, uh, loved uh, where you, I guess you, I guess you started it, or Sage Growth Partners with your, was your company back in the day. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. Started that firm in 2004, healthcare strategy and technology firm. Yeah. Great, uh, a great firm. I had a deep respect for it uh, with in my early days. So, um, and then we came across each other. Great. You were invited uh, into the think tank uh, that we have that we host about uh, every six months or once a year. We'll figure out how that goes all on. And but uh, that was kind of cool. A quick digression is that was the first one we ever offered a virtual component. Usually, the think tank <laughs> is always forty to fifty thought leaders in one room, but. It was just, you know, we saw how the, the world is, is evolving. And so middle of last year, we said, you know what? Our next think tank, we're going to create the virtual option. And so we got a greater span of thought leaders uh, and, and, you know, join as well as great people came, uh, you know, like you and I and, and others. And so we had, I think, 45 in the room and then another 35 yeah. via, um, tele, tele, you know, webinars and, and uh, the, the Zoom uh, uh, modality. Yeah, and it worked yeah. out swimmingly. So it, it was a it perfect. Did. And yeah. you can you can always look back and tell people how prescient you were when you were really just lucky. But you know you were yes. the forethought to do it was great. Yep. And uh, it it did go well. So. Yep. So that's the first time you know we met uh, in person. So I learned a little bit more about Canon Company. But but um, but tell me before we dive into the the uh, industry stuff, uh, where did you grow up? Attend college? All that good stuff for us. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm. Uh, as I tell people, uh, I'm a Baltimorean. I'm born and raised in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, passionate, uh, passionate Baltimore guy, and um, stayed in Baltimore and have been here really my whole life. I was actually talking to somebody the other day who made the comment that, "Geez, it's really different in healthcare for people or in any industry where you've stayed in the same town basically your entire life." And that was really my story. And so. Uh, went to Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, and uh, and then. Uh, 
got an MBA from University of Baltimore. So I've been here my whole life and I started my my first company, which was, uh, uh, I didn't really know exactly what the heck I was doing, but it was a revenue cycle, healthcare revenue cycle business. I started it when I was a senior uh, undergrad at Hopkins and, uh, you know, it got bit by the healthcare bug. And so uh, been here, have been here my whole life and uh, it's been, it's been great. And it's a great old town and like other industrial cities, a lot of challenges, but, uh, but I, I really uh, bleed uh, Baltimore. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be from Baltimore. Yeah, very cool. Excellent. So tell me a little bit what you're up to now. I mean, obviously you have Ken and Company. So, I mean, I guess personally, if there's anything that, uh, you know, outside of Ken and Company that you're up to or, or what do you guys focus on specifically in that organization as well? Yeah, so um, the um, it's been just a- absolutely a blessing for me to, to, to get involved with some really, really smart um partners, leaders, uh, you know, friends, executives that I had uh, known about in the industry. As, as you mentioned, I, I started uh, Sage and grew that business pretty significantly. And then I left uh, as the CEO, chairman and CEO for a couple of years to run a, a health tech enabled services business and did that for about three years. And then when I when I came out of that, um, I really wanted to do something else, and I was sort of tinkering with different things. I was talking to some um, private equity firms and some investment banks. I, I, I really have, uh, Justin, an interest in uh, d- disruptive technology, and, and um, so that was sort of like, uh, you know, e- even though I'm, I, I don't know a whole ton about it, I, I'm really more of an applied guy, but I thought, you know, that would be great to get involved in helping particularly early st- stage companies. And when I saw the value movement, uh, uh, you know, when, I, when I, I've always thought it was going to move. And when I, I think it really started to get some traction, I thought, geez, you know, what, what's starting to change is that these early stage companies don't necessarily have to wait around the pecking order. You know, it's, it's sort of like what's happened with digitization in general. You know, you can start a firm and you can have a small firm and you can compete with anybody in the world very rapidly. So all of the uh, stat, all of the conventional wisdom or status quo thinking around waiting your time and building a business long term you know that that sort of has gotten thrown out out of the window and through some some process efforts and and thinking and talking to a lot of folks and a lot of folks who gave me very good advice what we landed on was was uh, Canton and Company which is a, a deeply healthcare focus i would say deeply value focused um, smart growth accelerator i mean for lack of a better term i think people have heard this term accelerator related to early stage ventures we really an accelerator for what we call smart growth companies, smart healthcare companies, companies that want to excel in, in the new health economy. And what does that mean? To me, that means that I'm, I'm seeing signals and signs that market forces, uh, and I'm in the minority probably, but that market forces are very, very, very important. And they're, they're rearing their head and we're seeing more and more movement to, you know, a a true, you know, consumer centric model. We're seeing more and more focus on transparency. We're seeing more and more focus on reducing variation that we know is, is present. I mean, the things that we take for granted that in the 80% of our economic lives that that's not healthcare are, are all obstacles and challenges in healthcare. So that motivated us to put together a firm that could really help those organizations really try to make a change to 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 move the needle. And so we're we're in a we're a professional part, you know, sort of quasi piece of us is a professional services business. There's a piece of us that's a an investment bank and and in some cases an investor. There's a certainly a piece of us that is advisory and consultative in nature. And then what we've done, and I've done this with just in, incredible partners, uh, Kathleen Herzog, our marketing leader who also runs our marketing business, so a healthcare-focused marketing business, a technology business led by uh, Joe Riley, uh, a research uh, business uh, led by a fellow named Dennis Dekach. I mean, too many names to really mention, but but I would say what we're really trying to do, the, the lens through which we view this all is that really all healthcare is local, and if you think about that smart health market or smart health ecosystem, it's that local market and it's the it's the commensurate spend, the aggregate spend in that market and what people really get for it. And we know today they don't get a lot, you know, in terms of value. And we really want to be about trying to unlock value in these markets. And and the other part of that is 
doing some non-conventional things, thinking about things in a non-conventional way, helping firms that have proven that they're really excellent in other sectors, right, that want to come to healthcare and people say, oh, you can't do that because it's healthcare. We don't do it that way. Well, we, we want to challenge that sort of status quo thinking. So that's that's what the firm is is all about. It's been uh, we're, we're about three years old. It's been an absolutely fabulous run thus far. We've got a, a, a really decent team and growing and, and are just having a, a great time and working with fantastic people who want, who want to change the business. The, the thing, final thing I'll say on this, and I think it's really important, that there is more than ever a mission ethos, a, a consumer-oriented mission ethos that I'm thinking. What I mean by that is you know, um, we we've lost the consumer in healthcare. We haven't had consumer sovereignty around the economics for a very long time, 50 years or more, probably. Um, consumers are becoming more important. Part of that is the millennial push and, and generational changes and 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 uh, uh, demography. Uh, but you know, consumer the the consumer is really important, and that's very exciting for us to to help make that a you know a reality. Yeah. So. Excellent. Now there's a lot there. So what um what are you seeing? I mean, maybe a couple of things because I want to cover about five more questions. But what are you seeing in the industry right now? I mean, even even post COVID. Yeah, yeah. You know, I I think COVID's been really instructive, and I'm looking forward to. I mean, I'm spending a lot of time thinking about post COVID. But think about what we've learned. I, I don't think. Uh... I think we've learned that regulation probably hasn't served us well mm -hmm. as a consumer vis-a-vis -vis the healthcare system. I, I think, you know, you could run through the litany. We were, there's probably some failure by CDC and other government entities to be fully prepared for this. CON laws got in the way of, of access to care. Think about telehealth. Think about, I, I, I swear to you that I think for most of my clients that are provider organizations, it literally took them about a month to figure out how to really operate telehealth at scale right and had had telehealth you know let's say 15 years ago justin medicare said yeah we're going to pay for telehealth there should be payment parity and we should really be focused on whole holistic health we we wouldn't have even had this issue i mean in terms of the the treatment access issues right it would have been a blip um and and we deregulated uh and created access state licensing and other things these yeah. are these yeah. are market principles that become very very important so uh, not to mention supply chain, right? The over uh, leverage of the supply chain in Asia, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm thinking about this in terms of post-COVID a little bit like, you know, I love this four actions framework from Blue Ocean Strategy. And, you know, what should we do that's new? What should we subtract? What should we do more of and less of? And I'm hoping that we don't go back. I'm hoping that the genie doesn't go back in the bottle, that we, 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 we back off on some of the regulation. I do think that video and telepresence, and hopefully we stop calling it tele because we don't call it telebanking, but I think <laughs> that video is now table stake. It'll be interesting for me. I, I, I wonder if we've not, not entered an era where the video portion is just part of the delivery modality and that gets commoditized. If you think about the valuations of all of these telehealth companies in the regulated system pre-COVID, I'm not sure that there's a ton of special sauce. And now we're seeing, you know, a physician can pick up Zoom or Skype or whatever. And, and you know, now will we go back to the prior regulation? That's the open question. But I think you can make a very compelling argument that things have gotten a lot better for the consumer, and I'm hoping that we um, we, we stay there. Right. Nope. That's excellent, and I have to agree with everything you said. I mean, from a, even a standpoint of uh, well, first of all, I'll give you some I, my feeling, even from working out with some uh, regulators here recently and just being on calls and stuff. Is I, I don't. I mean, no one's championing the rollback of uh, telehealth. I mean, I think mm -hmm. there, yeah. the, the thought is not really the goal, because I don't think they have a goal yet, but the thought is how do we ensure we integrate this appropriately into new care strategies and how we're going to evolve care in the coming in the coming years. And and so I think everybody's on that same track. The genie, no one feels that we can put the genie back in the bottle. I'm not sure anybody, I, I mean, I know there's there's some people out there that want to, but I think it was, I mean, I know business models were developed around it for sure about, you know, place of service and certificates of need and all that right. kind of stuff. Uh, and and right. I agree with you and what you said about that. But I also think now there's a, there's such an overwhelming taste. People got to, the physician's got to taste that the health system's got to yeah. taste 
Now reimbursement yeah. is starting to flow. Patients got a taste. Consumers yeah. can now take hold. And you know, right. why would you go? Why would you go into us? I mean, my seventy-year-old mother who has a pre-existing or a, a um, compromised immune system, she is not going to go in to see a right. doctor unless she has to. My ninety-five year right. grandmother is not going back to the doctor unless there's an. They may ne right. never again. They Correct. may, they may use. They could be really healthy. It could be a great environment. They may never go back. That's a. There's a permanency, I think, in that trend. You're absolutely yes. right. Yep. Yeah. I do. It, it will. It will. It will shift evolution. So. Um, and yeah. for those joining us a little late today, my guest is Don McDaniel from Canton Company. So I, I always knew I knew I'd love our conversation. I did it at our think tank, and I, I'm uh, I'm enjoying it. So, how do you see the remainder of 2020 unfolding from a digital health perspective? You know, I I am very excited about digital. I I think you know it seems to me, Justin, and you're you're the expert on this. Where the puck's going is more distributed care, more distributed everything right it's care everywhere we were talking to a client the other day about a, this concept of of health at home you know holistically could you recreate much of what's done today in institutions and deliver that in the home and community and the reality is i think you can you can, you can do that right and a big part of what what enables us to do that is digitization. I was really taken aback, actually, when I studied this a little bit, the, the, the number of admissions, and there are a million data points, right, but the number of admissions um, that are really made, the patients admitted for the convenience of the healthcare system, for the, the, the convenience of organizing and coordinating the supply chain, the imaging, the other modalities, when the reality is we, we could have much better uh, uh, in a preferential way, treated the patient at home, kept them out of the admission, kept them out of the what I'm now calling the infection factory that is a hospital, and saved the system and the, and the consumer a heck of a lot of money. So I think digitization is something across all industries, right? It's it's sort of the great emancipator. And the other thing is, I'm a big believer in people, process, technology. I I am not a naysayer vis a vis or one of these people that is all gloomy about, you know, robotics replacing people. I think what this is all about is really allowing, you know, all of those tools uh, to operate at their at their highest level, right? And so I think we're seeing people evolve into different roles, to your point. So digitization is phenomenal. I think that the, the train has left the station. I, I, I think about this a lot vis-a-vis -vis hospitals. And, um, you know, I think that there is this inflection point or this innovation crossroads. You know, healthcare has been uh, both loath to innovate, uh, you, you know, at any excessive uh, pace, and they predominantly because they've been concerned about killing the goose that laid the golden eggs right. and killing the payment franchise. And, and you know, fee-for-service payment in this country is really the regulator. That's why telehealth didn't take off before it did, right? Because CMS didn't pay for it. And I think CMS, and I'm not a fan of government, I, I, I would love to see a lot less government, but I think you'd have to say that CMS has been an innovation driver in what they've done around MA and, and with chronic conditions and so on and so forth. So if you're a hospital, you know, do you embrace enabling innovation that just extends your status quo or your conventional franchise, the old health model, the sickness model, or do you really start to, you know, challenge that model and do you dare cannibalize your core business? And, and you know, this thing that we've been thinking about is if you're asking yourself, if you're in a, if, if you're a healthcare provider or a payer for that matter, but if you're a healthcare provider, and if it, in each and every case that you're having an interface with a patient, with a consumer, you're saying, geez, for every problem that we're trying to solve, are we maximizing value and minimizing cost? That's sort of max min. And when I say maximize value, I'm, I'm talking about focused on consumer, utility driven. I think the answer is that there is, even on in cases where care is necessary, there is a heck of a lot of stuff that's not done to maximize value, to maximize utility, and to minimize cost. And I think that's going to become the harbinger. Your your mother and your grandmother are great examples. I think that, you know, people before put up with this, but, you know, we're not going to put up with these massive infection rates. We're not going to put up with these crazy stats like, you know, 2% to two tenths of a percent of people come into the hospital with sepsis, but 16 or 17% of the death deaths are, are, are caused by sepsis. These, these things won't continue. They can't continue. And, and so I, I think digitization is going to do a lot of this. The flip side is when we need, 
you know, more acute modalities, we need those, and we are have we are going to see the age in the population. So, you know, it'll be interesting. Will hospital leaders step up and and really drive change in their organizations to 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 better serve communities and position their position their 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 organizations for the future? Um, but I, I I like uh, I think there's a ton of digitization. Uh, stuff that's in incredibly positive, and and I the the last thing I'll just say about this is, you know, as populations age out, all of these legacy questions we have about, you know, will older people use mobile technology? Will Medicaid recipients access this? Well, all of these prejudices, you know, that we mm -hmm. have or thought we had, they they're all th they, they've been disproven, right? right we right. we are in we're in a new world where people want access and they want instant, you know, they want on-demand support. And, and I think they're going to get it. And, and we're seeing a movement that's uh, starting. Yeah. So in that vein, what's the best practice? I got two final questions here. Regard So to give people some, you know, good, yeah. good meat from the, from even our think tank discussions. Yeah, but yeah. What are, what's the best yeah, practice yeah. that you would share with digital health innovators so they can thrive over the next one, two? You, you know, I, 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 um, I think this is a fantastic question. Number one, solve real problems. I mean, I tell early stage companies all the time, find real problems, solve them. Tr tr try to make them quantifiable. I think that, you know, healthcare more than almost any other industry is uh, is full of, you know, science projects and pilots. Mm -hmm. Right. And and so, you know, part of the reason why I love pre global payments and, and capitation, those things is the proof's in the pudding. You know, you're either going to improve health status and lower, the, and we can measure these things, right, and then lower the cost, right, or you're not, okay? So I, I would say, you know, focus on and solve real problems. And, and then the last thing is, uh, uh, make sure you're in the workflow. I mean, I think a lot of particularly young technology firms, they think that, you know, it's like, oh, I've got the greatest thing since sliced bread. Yeah, but if you can't get people to use your tools or your enhancements, or if it takes them off of their game a little bit, you know, they're, they're not going to use it. I, I would say I've seen more promising ideas sidetrack because the entrepreneur couldn't get their head around how to make their enhancement, uh, you know, relevant in the in the workflow or right. persuade people to to develop different workflows. So that's what I would say to to early stage companies. I completely agree. Workflow, workflow, workflow. So um, yep. So also tell, tell, so uh, finishing out some thoughts here. What are some of the best practices that you would share with care providers so they can thrive in the coming months and years? You know, I, I mean, I think, you know, I sort of live at 50,000 feet, Justin, or higher, so I, I don't think I have any great advice on the ground for operators uh, uh, other than I, I would. Well, workflow's a good one. <laughs> I'll dive into that. Okay, no, no. And I, right, and I would use these lessons. I mean, I, I, you know, people are, and I think there's a lot of truth to this. You know, we, no one was really prepared, couldn't have been prepared for COVID. That is true. Al although I do wonder why wasn't there more, and I'm guilty of this too, black swan scenario planning. Why why weren't we prepared for scenarios where potentially patients couldn't access institutions for an extended period of time? Why weren't we prepared as a system for scenarios where employees couldn't access systems for an extended period of time? Why weren't we more prepared for higher spiking infection rates? You know, it's these right. kinds of things where I wonder, and, and and I'll tell you, coming back to, you know, what is the responsibility of a hospital board, a community hospital board? These are the kinds of things that we need people to, to, to drive. So at, at, at that level, I would say really try to internalize um, the, these lessons on the, at the strategic level. And this is, again, a hospital centric comment. I, I think that there, there um, you know, this notion of trying to figure out how we create a competitive system to ourselves. How, how do we, in essence, how do right. we put the hospital, if we're a hospital, yes. how do we put the hospital out of business, That's right? Right. Because we have to have, you know, it's not just that the ambulatory services revenue is growing like crazy. I mean, I think that in the U.S. hospitals, you know, 57 or 58 percent of their revenue is now now outpatient it's it's more than that it's that we don't need these institutions to deliver optimal care and the hospitals have to decide where they fit they may decide we're a focused factory hospital and that's where we fit great get really really good at that get really really holistic around that and you know and execute but i think that um i, I would say use these lessons and learn from them yeah no that was terrific actually i mean and that's just a great lesson for anybody whether you're a health system whether you're a physician's practice whether you're an entrepreneur. Absolutely. 
how do you put yourself out of business and think about that? And then, you know, and maybe sometimes yeah. you, and you re-engineer and you become very inventive I, with that. I bet a lot of restaurant owners, you know, the ones, uh, you know, God willing that have been able to sustain are rethinking this whole, their whole business model right now. You know, it's like, you know, hopefully this never happens again, but you know, can we be better prepared if it does? So, right. And one thing I did from a personal best practice is about two years ago, I knew healthcare expenses were out of control. So I was a group that I actually joined and then got on their board and helped grow. But they basically are many, um, they're healthcare ecosystem. So they have a network yeah. of about 300 doctors in, in Georgia. And there's a there's a payer behind it that will insure. Mm -hmm. But it's a model that, they, you know, I drop my expenses by 90%. I have a doctor in my pocket at all times. And so when COVID hit, I had a, I have a, a texting, I have a texting and a, uh, a um, video chat relationship with my doctor. I see him once a year in person, but then everything else is done via my, via our web app. And yeah. so yeah. when COVID hit, he reached out and said, Hey, do you need anything? I'm always here. You know that I won't be in the office, but I'm going to be here. So I had a doctor, you know, 24 seven, my wife, and actually we got, we did go That's on a trip great. down to Florida. We drove, um, yeah. but, uh, but we got, she actually got sick on that trip, but my doctor mm -hmm. was a moment away and I actually had three doctors, you know, on a, on a chat. Um, diagnosing her issue. It was nothing major, but anyhow, it, it's a problem when you're, when you're traveling. So those kind of things, you know, I got in front of that a couple of years ago, knowing a cost and then B um, I had to find a solution, but Don, we are actually out of time, my friend. Um, I will have you back. Yep. We, we will always have a great chat. So um, I, I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. You got it, my friend. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. Uh, as you know, please join us weekdays and you can tune in at 2 30 PM Eastern, 1130 AM Pacific. As always, you can track me on Twitter at HIT Advisor. You can use the hashtag ThisJustinRadio so we can respond to your comments from the show. If you missed any of this episode or want to hear more, all my shows are always posted on Apple iTunes, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, Spreaker, Google Play, and TuneIn. Also, you can check out the new website that we launched at JustinBarnes.com. Thanks, everyone. Have a terrific week. And stay safe.